at 7 a.m. And then we will have a uh, 10.30 worship service here on Easter Sunday as well. So uh, a, a lot of good things going on. If you, are, if you have children, uh, elementary school, late preschool, uh, early uh, elementary school, we have a Sunday school at 10 o'clock each week. And after Easter, I'm looking to get together a new adult Sunday school class for newcomers and young adults and families. Uh, and we will start to... Um, uh, gather and fellowship together. That too will go at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, let's see. You see the important chicken, uh, uh, chicken pie project fundraiser. Uh, those chicken pies are delicious and that uh, sheet is self-explanatory, I think. Um, I think that those are all of the announcements I have today. Um, okay, Lucy Birch, who's our intern, if you're on Facebook, she's got some new hardware on her finger. She got engaged, so we're happy about that, and she's still off on vacation. But listen, she's not here today because she's still on that trip. So next week when she shows up, act surprised, okay? <laughs> really make her feel special. But we're, we're really happy for her uh, and pray God's blessing on their travels and their relationship. Uh, her fiancé, Garrett, look, uh, and she looked very happy. Uh, so um, those are all the announcements that I had. We continue our worship this morning. I invite you to join together in our call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. God summons us to wake up and see light has come to lead us to all that is good. God sees beyond our outward appearance. God knows the intent of our hearts.
God listens to all who worship sincerely. Praise God with openness and obedience. Let us pray. God of mercy, whose thoughts are not our thoughts and whose ways are not our ways, thank you for reaching out to heal us even when we have not asked. Your touch is transforming. You enable us to witness to your truth and walk in your ways. May we do so today that others may be drawn into the circle of discipleship. And all God's people said, Amen. I invite you to stand as sing, and sing as your able number 451 in your hymnals, Be Thou My Vision. you take a few moments and share the peace of Christ with one another. Peace be with you too. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, can we do, I didn't print it, but just the one verse. You guys can come up and bring a hymnal with you. and stand right back here and you can bring a hymnal too. Who's here? How about that? Hi! Piper Elizabeth, it's good to see you. We're so glad today to have the opportunity to welcome into the church Piper Elizabeth and uh, Nikki and Jeannie. It's great to see you. We're so happy. What a happy day. Keep smiling just like that, Piper. <laughs> Everything will be great. <laughs> and uh, so I would invite you to join with me. This is not just something for Piper and for the fa- I know. Hey, what's up? She's shooting the pizza out. It's for us as a congregation. Those in front pews, you have... Uh, 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 hymnals underneath your bench, but I'd invite you to turn in your hymnals to page 39, and um, we'll begin. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We're incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. What is the name of this child that was presented for baptism today? Piper Elizabeth Webster. Piper Elizabeth Webster. Amen. 
I have a few questions for you as parents, and then I have some questions for all of us as well, because we're entering into this covenant together. So on behalf of the whole church, Jeannie and Nikki, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. I do. And do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. If so, say, I do. I do. And will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, say, I will. Now to you as the whole congregation, to you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. If so, say we do. Amen. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this child now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround this person with a community of love and forgiveness, that she may grow in her service to others. We will pray for her, that she may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. You're so smart, you were reading right along with us. <laughs> Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures and the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. And do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now as we uh, have this, the thanksgiving over the water, uh, is our tradition that we have some folks from the congregation come forward. And at this point, I would invite Ashley and Kelly to come forward, Ashley Bailey and Kelly Mundy. Uh, it, it kind of, in, in participating in the service this way, it's representative of the fact that we just pledged that we might need to do something on behalf of little Piper at some time during her faith journey. So this is not just something for her, but it's a covenant that we're all entering into. So uh, Mary Catherine, could you pass us the pitcher of water? Thank you. And as I pray this prayer of thanksgiving over the water, Kelly, you and Ashley can come, and your sisters, but try and be peaceful to figure this out together, uh, to pour the water. And I want to say, uh, Claudia and Lacey brought back some water from the Jordan River when they made their very special trip to the Holy Land. And so that water is mixed in with this water. So literally this baptism is connected to the waters where Jesus was baptized so long ago. So as I pray this prayer, just kind of pour it slowly and with great drama uh, into the font. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea, and their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth, tell of God's mercy each day. And in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. 
Declare his works to the nations, his glory among all the people. And so, O oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit on this water to bless this gift of water and this child who will receive it. Wash away her sin, clothe her in righteousness throughout her life, that dying and being raised with Christ, she may share in his final victory. All praise to you, Eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with you and the Holy Spirit, lives and reigns forever. Amen. Now we keep it open to that page, okay? And could you hand me that towel? Thank you. Okay. Well, this is the fun part. Hey, sweetheart. Hi. Hi. Yeah, there's mommy. Piper Elizabeth, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And what we have done here washes away your sin, marks you with the cross of Christ, and seals you with the Holy Spirit this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. May God bless you. You want to wave again to everybody? Now, I'm going to kind of blot you off here, but in the waters of baptism, you kind of stay wet your whole life. All those folks out there, they are staying wet too, basically. So we're glad for that. And now, what I'd like to do, I've already checked this with mom and dad. I'm what? Oh, it's okay. Look, it's mom. okay. It's all right. Okay. Yeah. Mom, you want to come with me and walk her around? <laughs> You're welcome to. But what I'd like to do is uh, let you get to know Piper a little bit as we sing uh, Jesus Loves You. And we'll do that now. And I'm going to have somebody in the congregation uh, to kind of, I'm going to hand Piper off and carry her back up here as a symbol again of how we're all involved, that we might get called upon at some point in time to... Uh, to love and care for little Piper. So let's sing together. Now it's our joy to welcome our new sister in Christ. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as a member of the family of Christ. And may the Holy Spirit, Piper, work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus. Members of the household of God, I commend this child to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ, and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And now may the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, 
establish you, and strengthen you in the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may grow to, uh, to live in grace and peace. Amen and amen. And we get to do something really fun that Mary Catherine's been waiting for for the whole service so far. Would you go and ring that bell, which we've been doing as we welcome folks into the congregation for a long, long time. Oh, give it a good ring. There you go. <laughs> Amen. Let's quietly clap for baby and family. Thank you, baby. Following the service, we're going to take the water and the font out in the narthex as you're leaving. And anyone who is willing to remember your baptism, you can touch the water and maybe make the sign of the cross on your forehead in participating in that ancient connection of the church. Is it, is it usually our tradition, I can't remember, that the baby preaches the first, right, right after the sermon? Thank you. Thank you. Well, now uh, we have a special treat, a children's anthem this morning before they are dismissed to children's church. And it is a call and response. So I'd invite you uh, to see in your bulletin the words. You repeat what you're going to hear, and uh, we'll sing this together. Chuck? Sang as well as any of the other kids that are here uh, can go with Miss Autumn, our children's minister, to children's church. And you will be brought back right before the end of the service. So, uh, parents, you'll be able to reconnect then. And as they're making their way out, our next uh, item in the worship service is the prayer for illumination, where we prepare our hearts to hear the words of the gospel. That's okay. <laughs> That's so fun. It's worth waiting for and watching. It really is. If you don't think so, go to a church that hasn't had kids in a long time. You know? It is really a beautiful thing. Well, let us pray this prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our reading today from scripture comes from the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning with verse 24. And I, before I read the scripture, I just want to, it's a very long, the, the ninth chapter is a really long story. And so I kind of, I'm only reading the second half. But in the first half of the story, just to set it up, Jesus comes upon a man who is uh, 
uh, blind and has been blind from birth. And Jesus heals him. And he's, of course, really excited about that. But not everyone is excited about that. In fact, because Jesus healed him on the Sabbath day, that was sort of against the rules, according to the Pharisees. And so the Pharisees sort of want to put Jesus on trial. And they are calling in the man who was healed to try and get him to testify against Jesus. So it's that conversation between the man and the Pharisees that we pick up here. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man who healed you is a sinner. The man replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. And then they asked him, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? The man answered, I told you already and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? That really made them mad. That was my own commentary. They hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. Well, the man answered, now that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Well, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, Jesus said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe and worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Now some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What, are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
thank you, choir, for letting us soak in that time of prayer. The prayer that you sang became, I think, our prayer uh, together. What a glorious day, a great day to welcome a little one, to celebrate new life in our midst. Piper, you are so precious. Your parents are doing a great job. All your big families doing a great job. You are blessed, Piper, with a wonderful family, with a wonderful church family with wonderful friends who have promised now to live their lives after the example of Christ, to be there for you and your family, come what may. That's a beautiful day. It's a good thing you came along when you did. Three years ago this week, we hung a sign on the door. This is a copy of the very sign that we hung on the door. Three years ago this week, Greetings, friends. Our services for worship together have been postponed. We will not have church March, or we will not worship Sunday, March 15th or Sunday, March 22nd. COVID was upon us. The church is not a building or an event. The church is the people of God who love one another and follow Jesus together. Therefore, church is not canceled. The church is merely being the church in different ways. It's a good time you came when you did, or else somebody would have been frustrated that we couldn't baptize you. It's a good thing, Piper, that you came along where and when you did. 20 years ago today, lots of us watched as the U.S. military began its shock and awe military campaign in Iraq. So if you had been born in Baghdad on that day or around that time, that would have been a rough day for you to get baptized. Your parents and you probably wouldn't have ventured outside that day, but they sure would have been praying for you, Piper, and doing everything they possibly could to keep us safe, to keep you safe. Now, that's not to say that God wouldn't have been there in Baghdad or that God wasn't here three years ago today. God is present everywhere, you see, no matter what. And today we remember in your baptism that God is in your heart forever, and I wish All these folks would be as happy as you are right now. Yesterday, I got to spend some time with my wife, Jackie, and our grandson, Oliver, who came to visit with his parents. And when when he was happy and throwing blocks around the floor, making a grand mess of crackers and laughing with us, God was there to be sure. And when we managed to get him set down for a nap in kind of record time, we were quite proud of ourselves, God was there too. And I think, I mean, it's just a gift to have a baby in our midst, wherever we are. And it seems that God is especially there when that little baby's cuddling up with mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or when a a little baby wraps their little teeny tiny fingers around your little pinky finger, right? Or hallelujah, even when a little one is in the nursery and mom or dad gets to actually sing a hymn or pray a prayer or just enjoy a moment or two of peace. God is present in that as well. But that's not the only time God is there. I would imagine a lot of people 20 years ago were praying that night in Baghdad with bombs dropping nearby. And God is there in Ukraine right now and Sudan and Rwanda and Myanmar, all the places around the world where people are living in fear. I believe God is there in those homes It is scary to be sure, but God never says, wow, that place is off limits for me. That's too dangerous. God never says that. There are a lot of stories in the Bible where God was with people during their times of danger. So no matter what, God is with you and with us. God was with us three years ago just because we didn't meet in this building doesn't mean that God wasn't with us. Over the years, there have been more times than I can count that something has happened around me or to me that wasn't good. Someone comes to me from the congregation and says, Pastor Ed, I don't know what I'm going to do. This bad thing happened. It's terrible. I just don't know. Maybe it was an illness or a tragedy. Maybe someone took advantage of the person or a great mistake was made. Now, if you're getting nervous because you think that I'm about to tell your story, know that this is universal. This has happened more times than I can count. You're not alone. 
It's a part of what it is to live together in community, to share our burdens with one another. Not just like we talked about last week, the pretty faces and all of our fancy dresses and suits and things, but real life and real life brings with it sadness and difficulty. Walking with folks through times like that is hard but it's a part of what it is to be the body of Christ. I've been in those spots and I've told my pastor the same thing. A long time ago, when I was a senior in high school, I was invited to a university, Michigan Tech University. If you know your geography, you know that that is way up north, even in Michigan standards, it's way up north. Like we, from, I'm from Michigan. From Michigan, we always say, this is where we live, right? And we point to our hand. It looks like a mitten. Well, you can also put a second hand up there. That's the Upper Peninsula. And you can't go anymore. Michigan Tech is way up in the tip of the top thumb. And it's way up there. A lot of Canada is farther south than that point in Michigan. So I was up there for a scholarship uh, competition. In the winter, there was three feet of snow on the ground and the campus was rather deserted. And the scholarship event was kind of a train wreck, actually. It wasn't very well planned. Most of the students were home on winter break. I had to walk into town on Sunday morning to get breakfast wherever I could find it. And I went to church also that Sunday and I walked through deep snow because the cafeteria wasn't open and I didn't have anybody sort of staying with it. Was, it was a mess. And then it came time to get back to the airport and catch my flight back home to Balmy, Detroit. I tried calling a taxi, but I must not have, there were no arrangements made for me to get back to the airport. I tried calling a taxi. I must have told them to pick me up at the wrong place because the taxi never came and the time was ticking and I was going to get stranded. So I ended up flagging down a random student, the only one around. He was in a Jeep and I paid him 20 bucks and to a high school senior back in 19, whatever, that was a lot of money. And he took me to the airport. (laughs) I barely made my flight, but I did make it, which was pretty miserable. Needless to say, I didn't get offered the scholarship. And even if I would have gotten offered the scholarship after that weekend, I don't think I would have gone. (laughs) But here's the thing. God knew where I was. God was with me. I don't believe there was any point where God was up there in heaven elbowing the angel next to him saying, Oh, geez, Ed's alone. What's he going to do? Nothing we can do to help, is there? Chalk that one up to bad luck. Good luck to him. I don't think God says that. It's not like that. I wouldn't be surprised if God sent the guy in the Jeep. (laughs) I wouldn't have been surprised either if I would have missed my flight. But even then, I would have sat there probably crying in that little airport, temporarily stranded. And I'm sure God would have sent another kind soul to help me get home by Sled dog, maybe. God's just like that. And how do I know that God's like that? Well, because the Bible tells me so. In today's story in John chapter 9, Jesus just healed a man born blind. I left out the gross part, kids, when Jesus spit in the dirt and made some mud and put that muddy spit mud on the guy's eyes and then told him to go wash it off in a, in a pool. And I also left off that Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. I can only imagine how happy the man was to be able to see and how happy his friends were for him. And you'd think that everybody was happy, but as we heard, they weren't. The Pharisees heard about it and were upset because the way they saw it, in healing the man on the Sabbath, Jesus had broken God's law. And they were also suspicious because Jesus didn't come from around there. And so they were suspicious that maybe he was like a witch doctor or practicing voodoo or something, something not holy or good. So instead of being excited for the man and and for him, this man who can now see for the first time in his life, instead of him walking around and seeing the brilliant yellow forsythia bush, or instead of him seeing the magnificent red of a cardinal for the first time, or instead of seeing for the first time the contrast of a white puffy cloud against a deep blue sky. They haul the man into court and ask him to testify as a witness. They can't believe that a sinful man was healed on the Sabbath by someone who must be a sinner. So they investigate this law-breaking moment and they want to punish Jesus. 
Now, this man is really just a guy who hadn't had much going for him his whole life and happened upon Jesus. And now this guy received this life-changing, sight-giving gift. He doesn't really know Jesus. He doesn't yet have a dog in the fight with this whole argument with the Pharisees. He doesn't know what the problem is with the Pharisees. All he knows is, like the song we love to sing, I was blind, but now I see. That's all he knew. That's what he said. He even says, hey, you guys are so interested in him. Maybe you want to follow him too. I'm sure he'd be good with that. But that really gets the goat of the Pharisees, so to speak. So they throw him out. They can't really see that his life has been changed for the better. They're just so wrapped up in their own rule enforcement. And these Pharisees have the power to make the life of the man who came to see, who can now see, and his parents. They have the power to make their lives pretty miserable for them. And then in this passage, there's the verses that I use to title my sermon. It says there, right in John's gospel, Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out. And when he found him, Jesus heard what had happened and Jesus goes looking for the man that had been thrown out. That's how it works sometimes. It doesn't always work that way. When I needed a ride to the airport, I was looking everywhere to try and get me a ride to the airport that day. I was looking A few years later, as a young man, I embarked on that existential quest that they say I tried to find myself. I was looking to find myself. In the Bible, in another place, it says, ask, seek, and knock. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. It often happens that way in the Bible, but not always. It often is that we try to do the seeking, but sometimes it happens just the opposite. Like when one of God's beloved sheep wanders off from the 99 and gets lost and stuck and the shepherd goes looking until he finds you. Or you get thrown out on your ear, not sure how much trouble you're in, and Jesus comes and finds you. Like the favorite song says, Amazing Grace, I once was lost, but... Now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Sometimes we're just plain old lost. And Jesus comes and finds us. And when we get found, when Jesus shows up, whether you're in the gutter, in the garage, in grad school, under guard, in a jail, or Greensboro, or at grandma's house, wherever we might be lost, when Jesus finds us, something good will happen. We are able to see We're healed sometimes. We're given a second chance sometimes. But sometimes just God just brings us to our senses. That's all that happens. We're able to see clearly. God says, look, you're lost. We say, yep, (laughs) that's all I know. God says, what do you want? We say, well, I'd like to not be lost anymore. God says, I am the way. You can follow me. And that's where the choice comes in. God will give you a choice. Saying yes to follow God will change everything, even if it doesn't change your immediate circumstance. And that's important to know too. A lot of folks in prison will tell you that they had a come to Jesus moment, that they've gotten their life right with God, that they have repented of their sin, that they've even been forgiven, that they understand what they did. And God has forgiven them, but the state of North Carolina has not. They still have to serve out a long sentence. It's not a get out of jail free card. It's a get out of lost free card. It happens with health too. Someone facing a terminal diagnosis might not be healed like the blind man was, but maybe the fear or the bitterness falls away and being found makes all the difference to them. So perhaps this being found is an opening of the eyes of our heart. Being found by the one who created us, who loves us. It's the eyes of our hearts that are opened. And that will absolutely make all the difference for us. But not everyone is going to see it that way. There's some bad news sometimes. I've known a lot of people over the years. Their lives filled with harm as they've been entangled in relationships that are soaked in addictions. And those folks, they begin to see clearly. 
They're able to start overcoming their addictions, but they've been moving in addicted circles for a long time. And the toxic, toxic substance-centered people around them only try to drag them back in. Those other folks, those toxic folks, their eyes are still closed. They're blind to the transformation and the goodness available. And so it is with the Pharisees. They say to the man, you're a sinner and you dare lecture us? Get out of here. The man just says, who now is seen clearly, okay, you're lost. Jesus says that the one who was blind can now see, but the ones who thought they were the only ones who could really see are now blind to their own sin and their guilt remains. So starting to wrap this up here, Our scripture shows us that sometimes when we need some love, when we're lost, when we can't see the way forward, sometimes Jesus comes and finds us. When we couldn't worship in the sanctuary three years ago, God was still with us in our church because the church isn't this building. It's the people who carry Jesus in their hearts. God found us, each and every one. When the bombs are bursting in air in places in the world and God's people are huddled in fear, God can find us, each and every one, and sometimes bring protection and remind us of eternal life. So I hope that we will all come to see That the God of the Bible is a God who comes to find us when we're lost. God might send you a guy with a Jeep. Or a saint who writes cards. Or a friend with a phone. Or even a still, small voice. Or a song in your heart. I can't tell you how many times Thursday, Friday comes around... And I'm facing something hard going on in life. And all of a sudden, one of the songs that we sang here in church comes to my heart. And I find myself kind of caught up in the prayer. I think that's God looking for me, right? There's nowhere you can go that's too far, too scary, too complicated, too difficult, too lost for God to find you and save you. Piper, you can't understand what I'm saying right now. I'm not as interesting as your passing, but I want you to hear there is no place you can go in this life that's too far, where you'll be too lost, where it's too dangerous for God to be right there with you all of your days, no matter what. And one last point. Jesus is searching to find the lost. Jesus went looking for the man and found him. We folks in the church, we sing the song, I once was lost, but now I'm found. We claim to follow Jesus. So if we're followers of Jesus, and if Jesus is busy searching out the people who are lost, if Jesus is busy seeking out those who are sick and in need of a physician, if Jesus leaves the 99 to search for the one that's wandered away, if the man got thrown out and Jesus hears about it and goes to find and Jesus goes to find that man, if that's what Jesus is up to and we're followers of Jesus, then I think we must be accompanying Jesus in the search party. I want to follow Jesus, we sing. And we just said, we will so order our lives after the example of Jesus. We pledged it. And here in today's scripture, Jesus tells us what he's up to, who it is that we're following. He is actively looking for those in need of healing, of grace, of eye-opening love, of saving, of belonging. So we know what our task is. We know what our marching orders are to find those who are blind and help them to see, to find those who are lost and walk them back to being found, to join in God's great search party to all those in need of finding God, or rather being found by him. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, a few folks that we want to uh, lift up. Uh, Judy Stonebreakers, recovering uh, from hip surgery. Tom Alexander uh, asked for prayers. He, has, uh, he, he had some surgery on his face, and they have found some cancer, so please uh, be in prayer for Tom. Uh, we pray for Jimmy Street, who's over at uh, Person Memorial Hospital in the extended care unit. Uh, We celebrate with Mary Calhoun, who's not here today, but um, she is cancer-free, 
and we're so happy about that for her. Yeah, that's worth... I haven't used this term for a while, but I do have kind of a little club of folks that I call cancer kickers, and she just beat it and by the power of God, and so we're happy, so happy about that. We celebrate with the Sabastans on the birth of uh, um, Collins Grace Sabaston, who, uh, the newborn granddaughter of Bill and Elizabeth, she is though, or was, in the ICU, so she's needing a little bit of help to get going, but uh, please, uh, we rejoice with Bill and Elizabeth and Norma and uh, with the whole family as you keep little Collins Grace Sabaston in your prayers. This morning, I was asked also on the way in to pray for uh, Clay and Kim Scoggins. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And then uh, in a moment that I'm going to remember for a long time, one of our children came up to me here in the congregation and said, Preacher Ed, could we pray for my teacher? Her name is uh, Frida Tillman, and she lost her husband. Can we pray for him, for her, and for her family? Well, yes, we can. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Are there any others that we would lift up here today? Bob Morgan, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Anyone else? I just, I saw a few whispers. Bob was, he had uh, an illness this past week, and, uh, but we were texting back and forth in the hockey game last night. So I think he's, he's doing well enough to watch hockey. So we're happy for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> we do. Anyone else? Lord God, we thank you for being with us, uh, for finding us, for leading us back to you. None of us here, God, is perfect. And so we beg your forgiveness when we get it wrong when we trip and fall, when we harm or hurt others or ourselves, when we, when we sort of break our covenant with you. But, but God, we want to and we need to be found by you. And so we pray for your forgiveness and redemption, that you would make us whole again. You would shine your light for us to see as a beacon and that you'd give us our own light to shine so that others would see you when they see us. God, we pray for these uh, that we have named who are grieving or who are sick, we ask that your hand would be upon them, that you would comfort them. Throughout the world, O God, we pray for all who live in fear or agony, where there is not enough locally to support needs, where where there is war and violence in homes or in nations. And God, we pray that you would bring peace. God, we pray now the prayer that Jesus taught and continues to teach us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. At this time, I would invite the ushers to come forward as we receive our offerings, remembering that God is not broke, but the church uh, certainly depends on the faithful giving of folks that are a part of it.
God, we give you thanks for all that you have first given to us. We thank you for the generosity of all those who have gone before this to create this space that we can worship in. We thank you for the fabric of family that's woven together with so many giving, so many gifts and talents that we work together to to seek those who are lost, to bless those who are in need of blessing. God, continue to inspire us to generosity, to show us how to follow you, and when we get lost, God, to come and find us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we... uh, get ready to depart and go back into the world. We pray this hymn. The words might not be familiar to you, but I think the tune will be. Number 605, Wash, O God, Our Sons and Daughters. words from this hymn that we just sang. We, your people, O God, stand before you. We are water washed and spirit born. So by your grace, our lives we offer. Recreate us, God. Transform. Go in peace. Remember your baptism. If you wish, this uh, will be out and know that this is part of the water that came from the Jordan River, which is quite remarkable. Go in peace.